Welcome back to the Global Business Report here on Arise News. It's our Eye on Tech. This is one of the biggest stories of 2023. This is, they call it the Magnificent Seven. And these, of course, are seven stocks, well, seven of the biggest stocks as far as market capitalization is concerned, but also their returns. Let's quickly take you through this alphabet, parent of Google, as of yesterday, uh, this December the 14th, 50% return for Alphabet so far this year. Apple up, uh, returning 52.7%. Uh, Look at Amazon, 75.5%, but it gets bigger. Meta, <laughs> up by 167.09%. Uh, Microsoft up by 52.4 and 52.74. NVIDIA, I mean, we talked about NVIDIA and the fact that uh, Intel is coming out with a new chip to target NVIDIA. NVIDIA is up 230% so far this year. If you put $1,000 in NVIDIA to, at the beginning of this year, you're, you're sitting in the money. And then, of course, Tesla also making the news. Tesla is up 103%. No, speaking of Tesla, Elon Musk, seed money for a new university, uh, putting $100 million of his money, donating that to get a new university in Texas. And we're going to be talking about that right now as far as universities are concerned because we do have Dr. Babs Omotoa. He is the president and CEO of the Nigerian University of Technology and Management. Dr. Babs, you're very welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us on the Global Business Report. Good morning to you. Um, so I want to talk to you about university. How, would you like your students to go work at uh, those magnificent seven uh, companies? <laughs> Absolutely, Rotus. Uh, I mean, these are world-class uh, companies delivering world-class results. And uh, we at the Nigerian University of Technology and Management, we are developing world leaders, innovative leaders for the future. Uh, and these are the sort of companies that they work for. We have seen uh, even universities like the Indian Institute of Technology produce graduates that have gone to lead these sort of organizations. And that's what I see that uh, graduates will in future be not just working for these companies, but also leading these companies. But one more thing to add, uh, Rotis, is that we not only develop leaders who work for companies, we also develop uh, graduates who go on to set up their own businesses, set up multi-billion dollar businesses. Uh, and half of our students have already done that. So I expect that in the future, we'll actually see some of our students uh, developing uni new unicorns, big companies that will also be competing with this sort of magnificent seven. In terms of the quality of faculty um, that will train these students, I want to give you an example. I, I can't stop talking about India, and I apologize to my viewers, but the University of, I think it's the University of Chicago, uh, one of their business professors is a former um, governor of the Reserve Bank of India. He's an economist that's worked with the World Bank. I think it's Rajam Rajuran, if I have his name correctly. But he's part of the faculty. I mean, to have a former central bank governor in your faculty teaching students, I, mean, I can imagine how much they're paying there but can you tell me about the need to have quality faculty in your technology university to train this next generation of software engineers and so on in Nigeria Rotus, this is an absolute requirement. You cannot have a world-class university like we are trying to build without having world-class faculty. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, we learned a bit from the Indians as well who have gone through this journey with the Indian Institute of Technology. And the way we are going about it is that we're relying a lot at this early stage of our uh, development on world-class faculty. So most of our faculty today come from, you know, Stanford, from uh, MIT, from uh, Oxford universities, they come as uh, adjunct faculties, visiting faculties, sometimes they teach online uh, because this access to world-class individuals is very, very key to be able to achieve the sort of quality that we, we require out of our graduates. Uh, and what we have been able to do is to be able to get these sort of faculties to teach in our classes. They've been teaching over the last three years in our school uh, and you see the graduates that have come out of that product uh, are really, really top-notch. Not just because these are world-class faculty, they teach world-class curriculum, uh, which is industry-led and industry-driven, uh, and the teaching methods that they teach these students is quite different. It's not the memorization and regurgitation that you see in typical universities uh, around here, but more about experiential learning, practical learning, and at the leading edge of research is what they teach. So we're really, really very keen that uh, we have access to this world-class faculty to teach our students. In fact, I remember that his name is Rajan Raguram. That's, he's a pro business professor at the University of Chicago. So then I have to ask you this, uh, uh, doctor. Um, what about how much it costs to pay this faculty and how that filters in to the cost of tuition, uh, cost of education at your, at your university? It's got to be high if it's quality. 
Indeed, quality is not cheap, uh, uh, clearly. And uh, these faculties cost quite a lot. If you want faculty that are the leading edge of research, that are the world-class uh, faculties, you have to pay them uh, quite a lot of money. Uh, and what we do is that we have been very fortunate. We have quite a lot of uh, people who have been supporting us. We're a very unique university because we're an independent university, not supported by the government, federal, state, church or mosque, or by any ultra-wealthy individual. So we have been lucky to have a number of kind-hearted individuals, kind-hearted organizations, institutions and foundations who have been supporting us and have enabled us to pay this. In terms of school fees, of course, we... The cost will be very high to charge on, on individual students. So we just make our, our fees market-driven rather than cost-driven. And we rely on this support uh, of other institutions and other foundations to help us through this. I must mention that in Nigeria, we typically look at parents to pay for uh, children's education. This is not the norm in most developing countries. If you go to the US or to the UK, you find that it's either scholarships provided by ultra-worthy individuals or by corporations or students' uh, loan schemes provided by the government that finances uh, tertiary education. I think this is something we need to do a lot more of in Nigeria to encourage uh, ultra-worthy uh, uh, individuals to donate scholarships for students uh, and to get the government to really grow this student loan scheme to enable access to quality education for most of our young graduates. Okay, so that, that now leads me uh, to my next question, uh, Dr. Omotawa, because, Omotawa, because is there going to be a widening gap, you know, with what you're bringing to the, to the stage here, to the marketplace with your technology university, with your high quality faculty and what it costs? Does that now, with, if more universities like you come on the scene, does that increase the gap between the students that attend there, how far they are able to progress versus, unfortunately, public universities and so on, even other private universities that may not be at that level? Does the gap widen? I think one way to look at it, Rotus, is that today many of the students that, uh, you know, really go out of Nigeria to study in universities, you know, in the U.S., in the U.K., to get access to quality top uh, education. We are now trying to bring that into Nigeria so that people don't have to leave the country to get access to that world-class education. And more people then will be able to have access to that education. But to your question, really, you know, the challenge with um, a lot of the universities in, in the country currently uh, that are being promoted by the government, uh, either at federal or state, uh, is that the government really has no business in business. And the ability to really manage these sort of uh, institutions to world-class standard, uh, I think is not something the government can do to the extent they, they, they're really managing universities. So I think there's a lot of reforms that need to happen in these universities to allow uh, either alumni of those universities or trust and foundations to manage these universities, while government concentrates a little bit more on how to provide things like student loan schemes, uh, how to incentivize through tax credits uh, uh, ultra-wealthy individuals to be able to donate scholarships uh, such that those universities can have the same quality of faculty we have and the faculties that are in those universities can also get trained uh, and up to the latest technologies. So yes, you, you know, in terms of the gap, it's, it's there, uh, but we need to have reforms in public universities to be able to come up to the right quality that I think our, our young people deserve. Okay, I want to ask you about STEM. That's science, technology, engineering, and math. I understand that that's a, you are leaning heavily on that on your curriculum at the your technology university. Um, but a lot of the conversation for STEM has been about getting more girls into STEM. Is that part of it? Or are you do are you is it widespread for boys and girls? University, but we also do have management and entrepreneurship along with that as well. Uh, and indeed, you know, STEM, I think, is uh, a key for any country's development. Uh, and no wonder we are very focused on, on that. Uh, in terms of girls in STEM, this has been a global phenomenon that many parts of the world have been doing a lot to try and get more uh, female into STEM. We are very focused on that as well. In fact, for the first three years uh, of our institution, uh, we've had 42% of our students uh, are female. Uh, so we're really focused on that. In fact, the current cohort is about 50% of them are female. But we're beyond that, uh, not just uh, on female, we're also focused on 
those who are challenged, so physically challenged individuals, we also look out for them and we bring them into these institutions. But we also go out to look for people from educationally disadvantaged areas. So for example, one of the girls we brought in last uh, our cohort was a girl from the ex Chibok kidnapped girls. Uh, Mary is her name. Mary uh, worked uh, in the university. We gave her full scholarship uh, and she was able to really get this world-class uh, learning. Uh, and she's back now uh, and working to find solutions for some of the challenges she saw uh, in the North, including women access to education, entrepreneurship opportunities, and so she's working on that. So we're very keen on female in, in STEM, but also uh, challenge people who would uh, have physical challenge and also people from educationally disadvantaged areas as well. Uh, Dr. Obasa, before I came to you, we had the news, of course, that Elon Musk, who everybody knows, is putting $100 million of his money towards a technology university in Austin, Texas. You've got your university, another technology university. Of course, you mentioned, of course, you're doing management as well, entrepreneurship. But is our technology universities where we're going? Do you see a more proliferation of these universities threatening the more general universities that are out there? Is it because of the future, because of where tech is going, AI and all these things? Will we see more technology-focused universities down the line? I think the answer is yes, uh, without a doubt. Uh, I mean, experts will tell you, Rotus, that most companies uh, in the future will be technology companies. I will even argue that our lives is going to be technologically driven lives in our personal lives as well. So indeed, we have to produce graduates who are ready for that future, graduates who are going to be working in a lot of these tech companies, but also even the, uh, uh, the, the, the whole learning philosophy and, 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 and teaching methods these days are all tech driven. Uh, so, you know, I think every university will have to be tech in some way uh, and focus of curriculum, I think, will have to be technology. I don't think anyone should graduate from a Nigerian university or any university in the world uh, without a technology savviness because they will not be able to function well into the future. They will not find a lot of uh, areas where they can work. Uh, but again, I also will say entrepreneurship is very important, uh, which is why we also focus on that along with management because there will be fewer jobs. There are also problems in society that we have to solve, uh, and you need people who are able to solve those sort of problems uh, using technological tools and skills uh, going forward. So, Babs Omotowa, the president of the Nigerian University of Technology and Management, thank you for joining us on our Eye on Tech segment on the Global Business Report on Horizon News. Appreciate your time.